We've been going through the book of 2 Samuel. We finished up chapter 11 last week. Uh, this morning we're going to cover just the first 15 verses of 2 Samuel 12. We saw last week David's sin with Bathsheba. And we saw David's attempt to cover it up by putting a hit on her husband Uriah. We saw Uriah being basically murdered. David marrying Bathsheba, and it appears that David has pulled it off. And then we saw at the end of chapter 11, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And now as we get into chapter 12, we're going to see that God in his mercy keeps speaking to David, even when David wasn't listening. God kept speaking. And as we look here, we see it says, then, after all this now, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. This is that same Nathan, remember, back in 2 Samuel 7, who told David, do whatever's in your heart, David. You want to build? Build. And then God spoke to Nathan and says, uh, excuse me, I didn't tell you to say that. So he went back and said, no, I'm not going to allow David to build me a house. In fact, Nathan told David, God said, he's not gonna, you're not going to build him a house. He's going to make you a house. And your son's going to build a house, but he's going to make a house out of you, David. And we looked at that Davidic covenant, remember, and the promise that God had for David that one day the Messiah is going to come from David's descendants and all. So Nathan was close with David. And now David's in a mess, and it says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. I find that interesting. The Lord sent a friend of David's to confront him on his sin. He sent a friend. Oftentimes when the Lord has a word of correction for us, he'll bring it to us by someone who has a heart for us. Conversely, unless your heart is filled with compassion with the one you're going to talk to, you're probably not called to be the corrector. Amen. Typically, it's a self-appointed position we take. <laughs> Got him. Now I'm going to talk to him. Wrong attitude. Wrong heart. Remember Jesus on the night that he went to the upper room to meet the disciples. If you look at Luke compared to John and all, it appears that the disciples were once again complaining or talking about or arguing about who's greater. Those of you that are old here, remember the Smothers Brothers? All the old heads go like this and the youngers are like, what? But, but it's, it's the Smothers Brothers. Remember mom liked you best? They were having one of those arguments. I'm greater than you in the kingdom of God. Jesus is there, and that's what they're arguing about. When Jesus comes in, remember what he does. He doesn't rebuke him for arguing in the upper room. He looks and he sees, man, you guys got a bunch of dirty feet in here. And he girds himself, he humbles himself, he gets down and he washes their feet. And I think that's the lesson as we get into chapter 12. It's so important. I have no right to point out the dirt on your feet unless I'm willing to get down and wash those feet. Over and over and over and over and over again. That's the heart of a corrector. Man, you got a problem. I want to help you. I'm here to help you. And we're going to see today as we look at this that Nathan appears to be that type of a guy. And we're going to learn from David as we look at this, something I think most of us have experienced sometimes in our life as we get into chapter 12, and that is judging based on our own areas of weakness, our own sin, and judging harshly from that perspective. Let's take a look. We're going to look at the first four verses here. First off, we'll just call it Nathan's parable. So Nathan, it says in verse 1, then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he says, you know, there were two men in one city. One was rich, the other poor. The rich man had flocks and herds. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says many flocks and herds. It doesn't even say that. It says exceedingly many flocks and herds. This dude had a lot of flocks and herds. Do you see that? He says, so this, this rich man had all this stuff. The poor man had nothing, had nothing, except oh, 
one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and was with his kids. <laughs> Man, this is their pet. That was their pet lamb. Remember Pastor Anthony talking about butchering, what was it you were butchering? A pig. And it was Alicia that went out and made friends with the pig. That was a big old mistake. <laughs> it didn't taste as good if it was friendly. It just... <laughs> It's okay to eat bacon, but bacon's got a name on it. It's not good. And, well, here's this little lamb. Here's this little lamb. And it's the family pet. You ever have pets? Anybody have pets? That's their pet. Could you imagine? That's your pet. And then in this parable, he says something. This pet ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. Interesting choice of words Nathan makes. Because if we remember in chapter 11, when Uriah was talking to David, remember? And David said, go home and spend time with your wife. Remember what Uriah said over there in verse 11, towards the end of it? Uriah says to David, shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? And Nathan uses that same phrase. And you got to think, ding, 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 ding. Just a little bit. And it was like a daughter to him. So this guy's got this little pet lamb. And a traveler came to the rich man, some, some sales dude comes through or whatever, who re, and he refused, the rich man, I'm not going to take from my own flock and from my own herd to prepare for the wayfaring man who'd come to me. But he took the poor man's pet and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Now notice, Nathan did not ask for David's judgment on this. He's just telling him. And obviously, David doesn't understand this is a parable. David thinks this is one of the real deals. And Nathan's just telling him. It's interesting, he uses a little lamb to reach the shepherd king's heart. David was out in the pasture with lambs as a little guy. He knows about that. And then he uses a true leader's need for justice to the poor. That's what a true leader does. He makes certain that the poor have justice. And he hits both on the shepherd king parable, or this parable for, to the shepherd king. He talks to the little lamb, David gets his emotions up, and lack of justice, and David's all into this by now. And then we see in verse five and six what he says, notice, so David's anger was greatly aroused. Not just aroused, greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, and he evokes the Lord's name here, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. First off, he wasn't asked for a judicial opinion, but David was into it, and it hits a soft spot we'll see in a minute. But he'll die? That's a little bit harsh. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And as we look at David, how many of us can relate to that? He, it, this, this shows us how we are often the harshest on those who are involved in the same sin that we are. Have you noticed how our own sin looks so much worse than somebody else? We can justify our sin, but if someone else is wearing it, it's like, meh. Off with their heads, you know. No mercy. No mercy. Unless it's for me, of course. I don't need mercy. That's how that works, is it not? So David, he hears this. He evokes the Lord's name. He says, man, that sin looks disgusting, you know. He says, he needs to die. He just needs to die. And then he says, yeah, he should restore fourfold for that lamb, which is what the Bible tells us should be done. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, it says this, if a man steals an ox or a sheep, slaughters it, sells it, he should restore five oxen for that oxen and four sheep for a sheep. 
So we see David knows the word. He knows the law. In fact, his sin did not cancel out his Bible knowledge, but he now wants to go ahead and judge based on the law. Tunics on steroids. Not only give the four back, let's kill him too. Because he did this and he had no pity. David went even further than the scriptural consequences because he was so closely associated without even realizing it. Then in verse 7, then Nathan says to David, you're the man. Just let that sit in. Realize under the law what that meant. Under the law, if you murder, you're dead. Under the law, if you commit adultery, you're both dead. You're dead. No questions asked, you're dead. And Nathan has just looked at David and said, it's you. The most powerful man in the world at that time. <coughs> and Nathan confronts him on his sin and says, it's you, David. Suddenly, David understood. David understood a lot, I think, right at that point. Maybe some of us understand it too. When you point a finger at somebody and say you're guilty, we all know. There's three of them pointing back. And when we start pointing fingers, we got a bunch pointing back. But isn't it fun? It's so fun to point out other people's faults. I love that. In the flesh, I love to point out people's faults. It makes me feel so good. I'm not as bad as you, buddy. You know, that's how it works. But it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. David started to get this. The Old Testament law and the Sermon on the Mount both drive us to a place where we can look at the Word of God and say, I'm a sinner. I need God's grace. Remember Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you've heard it said in days of old that you should not commit murder, but I say to you, if you get angry at your brother without a cause, you've already murdered him in your heart. So you lose your temper in God's economy, that's murder. Lose your temper without a cause, that's murder. You've heard it said in days of old, you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, if any man looks at a woman to lust after, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus takes the law, and he says, there's the standard, guys. And we're going, okay, I'm pretty good. I haven't done that. He says, oh, yeah? If you get angry, if you lust, you're already guilty. And the law, the word of God, takes us to positions. I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. There is none righteous, the Bible says. No, not one. We like to think that we're righteous. If you compare yourself to me, maybe you're righteous. But I'm not the standard. Jesus is the standard. And there's none righteous. No, not one. So David, he says, you're the man, Nathan says to him. That's what Nathan said. It's you, David. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. He now explains what God is telling him. And here it says, thus says the Lord God of Israel. This is what God says. Speaking for God, Nathan says, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Yow. As we look at that, we see David, God is telling David, your base sin is not adultery, not murder. Your base sin is ingratitude. I've given you all this and you want more. If you wanted more, David, I'd have given you more.
But now we're going to see that God's heart was for David. As messed up as David is, God's heart is for David because David had a heart after God. And we're going to see now, it goes on in verse 10 to 12. Now therefore, God's still speaking through Nathan. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you've despised me. And you've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord. Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before Israel, before the sun. David brought adultery, lies, murder into his home, but God says now your family is going to be plagued by the same thing. It's going to be passed on down. First off, he says, the sword will not depart from your home. It's interesting. I find it so interesting. David's, when they said, you know, this is what happened. He gave him the parable. David says, well, he's going to, he should, he should die, but also he should restore fourfold sheep to that one little sheep that he took. That's law. So David says, according to the law, let's judge him according to the law. I often wonder what would have happened if David would have heard that parable and said, wow, let's bring those two guys in. Let's sit down and let's get this restored. I don't know. I'm just wondering. I'm way away from the pulpit now, right? So it's just me talking here. But I just often wonder what would have happened if David would have showed mercy right there. Jesus says, you know, judge not lest you be judged. And, you know, the Bible teaches, be careful how you judge because that's the standard you're going to be judged by. Amen. Amen. And David said, we're going to judge him according to the law. And then he says, the sword's never going to leave your family. And you wanted fourfold restitution for this guy in the parable? Do you remember that this little boy that was born to David and Bathsheba dies now shortly? He has to bury a child. No one should have to bury a child. Then Amnon. He's going to bury Amnon. That's two. He's going to see Absalom executed in a tree. That's three. Adonijah, his fourth son, is also going to be buried by his dad. Four sons... David will lose. Which is interesting when he said he wanted a fourfold judgment. Yeah, it was the law, but he wanted justice under the law. And I just wonder what would have happened if he just said, let's show mercy to these guys. Let's get this reconciled. I don't know. I'm just saying. Okay, back in the pulpit. That's just me talking. Don't write none of that down. Forget about it. I'm just asking a question to think about it. But we take a look. And he says, David's concubines or his wives will be dishonored publicly. He says, you did it in secret. You're going to see your girls dishonored publicly. If we take a look at 2 Samuel 16. In 2 Samuel 16, verse 20, check this out. This is kind of crazy right here. It says in verse 20, now you know the story. We're going to be getting there down the road. We know the story. But what's going to happen is, is David's in the city. Absalom, is, his own son, has risen up against him. And Absalom has played, they call it the Absalom game even, where he says, well, if I were king, this is what I would have done, you know. And, and so Absalom wins a number of people to his side. And now he's coming into Jerusalem to fight with David. And David, that's my boy. I'm not going to fight against my boy. Well, David, we can take him. No, that's my boy. So David leaves Jerusalem rather than fighting Absalom, his son, goes across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. He's crying as he goes. His son is rebelling like this. He's like, ugh. And Absalom comes in. But as Absalom comes in, we see Nathan as one of David's main advisors. He's got another main advisor. In fact, his name is Ahithophel. And Ahithophel, and those of you that know the scriptures in Numbers, you remember Balaam? Ahithophel and Balaam are two peas from the same pod, if you will, are two prophets from the same pad. They're, there they are. They're, they're these two guys that are in it for what's in it for them. 
So they're prophets for profit. And Ahithophel switches sides. He sees Absalom's kind of moving up. David, you're kind of like a has-been. He jumps over to Absalom. And Ahithophel, if you read about Ahithophel in Jewish literature, what the rabbis write about Ahithophel, it's an amazing study. And those of you that study, I would encourage you to look it up because it's pretty interesting what they write about Ahithophel. But Ahithophel is there with Absalom, and Absalom is now coming into the palace. Here he is. We can see it. We'll be covering it in a couple of weeks. When David leaves, he leaves 10 of his concubines back to take care of the palace. And here comes Absalom in. He says, Ahithophel, what do I do? I'm, they're not here. What do I do? He says, well, you're the new king. What do I do? He says, well, one of the things you want to do is you want to go into the former king's concubines to show everybody in Jerusalem you're the king and David's doing nothing about it. So Okay. So they pitched a tent up, brought his 10 concubines in their Davids, and Absalom goes in publicly to them to show that I am the king, marking his territory, if you will. What is very interesting is it tells us they pitched the tent on the roof of the king's palace. The very roof David was walking on in chapter 11 when he looked and he saw Bathsheba. And he looked and he liked and he lusted. And the consequences of his lust are publicly played out. The consequences are publicly played out at the very same spot. The consequences come literally onto his home. And it says here in chapter 12, the sword will never, in verse 10, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me. He's going to bury four of his kids. And you've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Thus I will raise up adversary against you from your own house, Absalom. And I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. Turns out to be his own son. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. You did it secretly, but I'll do this thing before all Israel. Before the sun. David's punishment. Verse 13. So David said to Nathan... I've sinned against the Lord. That's his whole confession. I've sinned against the Lord. That's it. Notice, confession does not have to be long. Those of us with Catholic, Roman Catholic backgrounds, you know how that is. We'll go into confession now. Well, what's your sin? I don't know. I'll make something up. I'll go in there and tell him I did something bad. <laughs> Just spend some time in there. Confession does not have to be long. In fact, notice David he doesn't even get emotional. Confession doesn't have to even be emotional to be sincere. We remember, let's take a look in 1 Samuel 15. We remember when we were in 1 Samuel a couple months ago. 1 Samuel 15, when Samuel confronts King Saul with his sin, remember, with the Amalekites, where he did not take out the Amalekites and all. In his confession, Saul's confession in verse 24. Then Saul, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. Whoa. David, I have sinned against the Lord. Saul, I have sinned. And I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. And say, I'm not going to return with you. You rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned around to go, and Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore his robe. And Samuel spins around and says, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. So God's not changing his mind on this. Then Saul says, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people. Before Israel, return with me that I may worship the Lord, your God. There's the heart of the matter. He didn't have a heart after God. He says, honor me in the sight of the people. Don't, don't, don't make a scene here. Just calm yourself. Long confession. Emotional confession. Grabbing him, ripping, please, begging him. But we see there was no true repentance. He was just talking, basically, wasn't a heartfelt confession or repentance. 
So true, sincere confession doesn't have to be long. It can be. Doesn't have to be emotional. It can be. Those are inconsequential. It's not a matter of the length or the strength of our emotion. Has nothing, repentance has nothing to do with that. Uh, confession has nothing to do with that. Nothing. What it does need to have is what David had. I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't say I made a mistake. I made an error in judgment. I had an indiscretion. I have a problem with that. No. He called sin, sin. And he acknowledged it was a sin against the Lord. Remember Joseph in Genesis chapter 39 with Potiphar's wife. You remember, come lie with me, come lie with me. He took off and he, he left. Our perverted minds, we tend to focus on the fact that he left naked. We miss the fact that he left. And he says, how can I do this and sin against God? Recognizing where the sin truly lies. Acknowledging our guilt, taking responsibility before God, a sin against the Lord. David's confession, it's one verse, and it's a small, it's a small little verse, and it gets even crazier. In the Hebrew, I have sinned against the Lord, it's two words. Two words. I don't speak Hebrew yet. Give me a year. Give me a year, guys. Give me a year. Next fall, one of our classes we have New Testament, Old Testament, church history, theology too, and it appears Hebrew. How many of you know Lee Wilson? Anybody? How many of you know Lee Wilson's like a Hebrew buff? Well, he has agreed to come down and teach Hebrew in one of our classes. We're not going to be speaking Hebrew. We're not going to be reading Hebrew, but we'll be able to bluff it. Much like my Lit 2 class, they bluff Greek now. Well, when the Greek it says, they're bluff. I know they're bluffing because I taught them. And I'm bluffing. So, I mean, it's, they're bluffing. But this is what it is. But they learn a little bit of Greek, and we try to go there. We're going to learn a little bit of Hebrew next year. So that's open to anybody. You want to learn some Hebrew? I dare you. So that's what we got. But interesting, interesting to see. In the Hebrew, it's two words. Hata al Yahweh. That's it. That's the, whole, that's the whole thing. I have sinned against the Lord. His confession is so short, but it's heartfelt and it's real. And guess what happens if we have heartfelt confession? Forgiveness takes place after only 30 days of penance. No, no, no. Our Catholic backgrounds are really only 30 days. Not, no. You're forgiven immediately. You're forgiven for immediately. Immediate forgiveness. It's done. Now, people, they forgive you so quick. And then we have that false doctrine that says, well, you need to forgive yourself. No, the Bible doesn't say you have to forgive yourself. Aren't you glad? Well, I'm forgiven. I just can't forgive myself. Well, good, because you can't. Wouldn't it be nice if you could try to? We know that even in the world we know that. Go to the bank on your loan and say, you know, I forgave my loan. <laughs> they go, what? Yeah, I forgave it. But yet we think we have to forgive our sin. We can't forgive our sin. We can't forgive ourselves. You don't have to forgive yourself. That's a lie from the pit of hell to keep you in bondage. Don't buy that. Jesus forgives you. Life's good. Go forward. Don't look back. Go forward. You're forgiven in Jesus, right? We got that? So David goes, well, I've sinned against the Lord. So you're forgiven, but guess what? Sometimes there's consequences. Oh, man, just when we thought we had it, huh? Sometimes there's consequences. Sometimes they're lifetime. But you know that sometimes consequences God will use to be a blessing? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? We're going to see that. Next week, we're going to see how God is going to take the consequence of outright sin and say, watch this. The world says you're toast. The world says you've done too much. That's it. God says, watch this. And he is going to bless the living daylights out of David and Bathsheba? Yeah, what's up with that? My human way, look at that, says, no way, that can't happen. And God says, I'm going to do it. Well, you can't do it, I'm going to. Well, you can't, he's God, he can do whatever he wants to do. And I know that hits us because we like to see judgment. If you messed up, I want to see you suffer a little bit. Get a little bit of blood from you before we forgive you. God's not like that. So I don't want your blood. He says, I've shed mine. You don't need to bleed for your sin. Jesus did. You just repent. Turn. 
And watch what God will do. Mm, it's pretty good. Pretty stinking good. Confession doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be emotional. But it does have to acknowledge sin is sin. And you get forgiveness immediately. Immediately. No penance. No probation. No problem. You're just forgiven. Pretty good. And then Jesus says, we're to forgive each other that way. Ugh. I like it when you forgive me that way, but I don't have to forgive you that way. Do you? Yeah, I got to do the same thing. What? Can I withhold it just a little bit and make it hurt a little bit? Well, you can, but whatever you do, don't say what we wrongly call the Lord's Prayer because Jesus never prayed that prayer. The disciples said, teach us to pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17 where he prays for you and me. But the Lord's Prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, you know it. But remember in the midst of it, he says, and forgive us our sins, debts, trespasses, depending on what denomination you came from and all. But forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So when we pray that, we're saying, God, I can't forgive her because she's a jerk. So Lord, forgive me the same way. Well, that's kind of stupid. <laughs> Don't pray that. If you can't forgive, if you got bitterness and you got unforgiveness, don't be saying that prayer because you're basically saying, God, forgive me the same way. Don't be doing that. But we forgive. We're forgiven immediately. We forgive immediately. We don't pull the old line, how many times have we heard it? Oh, I can forgive. I just can't forget. Man, don't do that. Could you imagine if God forgave us that way? But that's what we're saying. God, forgive me the same way. Remember the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34? We talk about it almost every week. We remember. God says through Jeremiah, I'm going to create a new covenant. In that covenant, I'm going to take away your sins. Not cover them, I'm going to take them away. And I'll remember them no more. He's going to forget our sin. And that's how we're to forgive. We forgive and it's done. We forgive. We forgive. Nathan said, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Because remember, David said, you should die according to the law. He should die. And Nathan says, you're not going to die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child who is born to you shall surely die. And Nathan left. Can you imagine? If you've ever had a death of a child of any age, you know the fear that coursed through David at that point. Not my baby. No. And Nathan leaves. Next week, we're going to pick up on God's amazing mercy and restoration. How good God is. But it was during this time and about this time that David wrote a couple of his most famous psalms. We want to just kind of close looking at those in Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, David writes this. It's called a prayer of repentance. In the Bible, um, I just look at it like true confessions. You know, you ever been in the grocery store and you look at those magazines you don't want to look at, but they're just there, they're just in true confessions. What's that? Well, here's the real, original, the true, true confession. He cries out in verse 1. He says, have mercy upon me, O God. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. So David knows, I deserve death. He writes this psalm, and he says, have mercy upon me, O God. And then as we look at the first five verses in this psalm, we see that David now has the right relationship with sin. And he says, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. He knows that his judgment or his sin deserves judgment. He understands that. He says, oh God, cleanse me. 
Then in verse 3 and 4, he, he talks about the guilt that he has. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is always before me against you, Lord. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He owns up to his sin. You can't pass the buck on this one. God knows us, you know. Then verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Sin, the right view of sin. It deserves judgment. Sin needs to be confessed. He declares his guilt. And then he talks about the sin nature. It descends from Adam. He has the right view of sin. Verses 6 to 12, we see now he has the right view of God. In verse uh, 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. I'll be clean. Wash me. I'll be whiter than snow. God desires inward purity, not just outward religious activity, but inward purity. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they're going to see God. He's looking for purity on the inside. Then he says in verse 8, Make me your joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. It's like, what now? He desires inward purity, but he does distribute punishment. David, remember, was a shepherd. He knew all about what I'm going to share. Most of you know where I'm going. But if not, it's one of the most amazing things. Something shepherds in the Middle East still do today. They've done it for thousands of years. Those of you with a wayward child, maybe one of you or some of us have one child that clean up the food on your plate. No. And you go, man, they're only three. Doesn't it be crazy? And they get to be 10. It's time to go to bed. No. You wait for them coming from school. Where is that child? I don't know. And you just go, this one's got something, he's got something special. I got 12 kids, but this one's kind of special. And you love that one, but you always got to be looking for that one because he's always pushing the boundaries. And he's not only pushing, he's crossing those boundaries and he's kind of giving you whatever he gives you as he goes across the boundary. It's just, he's way out there. Well, some of you understand, they say, well, I've got one of them. Maybe some of, I was one of them. I still am one of them, you know, whatever. But when the shepherd had a little sheep like that, the 99, and it was the one that went off. He would leave the 99, go get that one, bring him back, and he, there he goes again. There he goes again. There he goes again. Man, there's wolves out there, sheep. You can't be doing that. There he goes again. And when he continued to go, the shepherd would take that precious little sheep. And the little sheep go, oh, I get to go away from the sheep. My master comes and gets me and carries me back. This is great. And the shepherd takes that long skinny leg of that lamb in his hands, breaks it. They still do that today. And you can about imagine with that sheep and, ah, he's crazy, he broke my, you know. <laughs> then he splints it. And he takes that sheep and he puts him around his neck. For the next six weeks, that sheep is on his shoulders. Time to go to the bathroom, sheep? Here you go. Takes him to the bathroom. You want some water, sheep? Here you go. All day long, he's right there, right next to the heart of that shepherd. At the end of six weeks, the sheep's leg's good. But there's a special bond between that shepherd and that sheep now. That sheep loves that shepherd. And that sheep never wanders again. That's what, you, that's what David's talking about here. He says, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. I wandered. But now it's time to rejoice. Blessed are those who mourn. We oftentimes think it's mourning over illness or death. Oftentimes it's just mourning over a broken relationship with the Lord. And Jesus says, and you'll be comforted. You'll be comforted. 
Take a look, if you would, at the book of James. New believers, James is way in the back of the Bible. It's the eighth from the end. So you have Revelation, and then you have seven general epistles. It's the first of the seven book of seven general letters before Revelation. So if you come to Hebrews, that's a big book. It's right after Hebrews. But if we go to James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse 7, he writes here, now James, remember, is not the disciple James. This is the brother of Jesus. And again, those of us with Catholic background, we go, wait a minute. I thought Mary and Joseph didn't have any kids. That's not what the Bible says. So I got a decision I got to make. Do I believe the Bible? Do I believe the church? Bible, church. Bible, church. Yeah, go Bible. So uh, believe the Bible. Just believe the Bible. You'll be safe all the time. But he had a bunch of brothers according to the Bible and sisters. That's what the Bible says. So Jesus is the oldest brother and then even gives the names of the brothers. And right after Jesus, Joseph and Mary do have a baby for real. Not of a virgin birth, but of mom and dad birth. And they name him James. And they have a bunch of other boys and then they have their last little boy. They name him Judas of all things. Isn't that something? Not the Judas that we know in the Bible. Not that Judas. But Judas of Joseph and Mary. They called him Jude. You can kind of see why. But they called him Jude. I don't know if anybody's ever had a baby and said, let's call him Judas. Aw. But it's just one of those names that have been ruined because of what he did. But this is Jude. He also wrote a book. He's at the last of the general epistles, the book right before Revelation. Those are the two brothers of Jesus. Well, this guy, James, he was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus ascended and, and they started persecuting the church and all. They went to the brother of Jesus. He now became a follower of Christ after Jesus died and rose. Now his own brother believed in him at that point. And they said, James, you're the brother of Jesus. You be the pastor. So James is the pastor. And can you imagine the people in his church? He had Peter in his church, John in his church. Man, that's a serious congregation right there. But he was the pastor. That's this James. He writes this letter. This is the first letter that was written in the entire New Testament. So even though it's in the back of the Bible, this was the first one written. And James, writing to Jewish believers who have scattered because of the persecution, he says this in chapter 4, verse 7. He says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Notice he doesn't say talk to the devil. He says resist the devil. You don't need to be talking to the devil. Don't be rebuking the devil. If you're going to bind the devil, please bind him permanently. Because he's not bound right now, but I've been to a lot of meetings. I bind you, Satan. You can't bind him. Stop it. He will be bound for a thousand years, but Jesus is going to do that. It's in the book of Revelation. We got nothing to say to that thing. We don't talk to him. We just leave him alone. We resist him. That's it. So resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God. Uh-huh. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament. Uh-huh. And mourn and weep. And when we do that, guess what? We will be forgiven. And then what happens? Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Do that now. Don't just laugh at sin. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. If the Lord lifts you up, we don't have to lift ourselves up. We lift ourselves up, that's called pride. We humble ourselves. We don't look to get into leadership to tell people, tell you what to do. You don't need me to tell you what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. I don't know. But I can tell you what God's word says. But leadership serves. It doesn't dictate. It's amazing. Over the 30 years of ministry, the number of people who have come with a worldly mindset, they come to the church, and they say, we don't have to pay around here to get into leadership. Do you know that's true? Old Sitsky's been with me for almost 30 years. We've had people come and say that. What do I have to do to get into leadership around here? I say, well, the toilets need cleaning. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was Rachel, for those who didn't know. That was Rachel. She goes, yeah, get some help. A little help here, a little help. I don't know who cleaned the church last night, but whoever it was, thank you. Thank you. I came down here later last night, and it wasn't cleaned, and then I came down early this morning, and it was, so thank you. But um, I have a pretty good idea because your trademark signature was on the chairs in Jerry's place. So I think I know who did it, but whoever it was, thank you. Thank you. Don, we're going to have, oh, he's not, are you in here, Don? There, he's back there. 
We're going to have Don come up and talk about that, not today, but in the future. I know he doesn't like to talk in front of people, so we'll give him some time to worry about it. There you are. <laughs> are you going to talk now about it? Come on up. Right now will work. Do you know about this? Of course I do. I don't. Okay. I was just told Don's going to talk about church cleaning. Okay, cool. There you are. All right. Uh, Ms. Connie asked me to mention oh. this. We talked about it last week. Cleaning the church. Pretty easy. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, and the more important thing is we have a schedule over in Jerry's place. So if you want to get involved in that, all the cleaning supplies are there for you. And sign up on the schedule. Get scheduled. That way we don't clean the church two days in a row, etc. cetera. Uh, I'll be happy to meet you here, get you access, and we'll do that. Also, if you're going to use Jerry's place for a private function, same thing. There's a calendar over there. That's how we schedule Jerry's place. Write your name, Jerry's place, and the time that you need to use Jerry's place. Let Rachel know so we can make sure we don't have two groups of people showing up in Jerry's place at the same time. All we ask is that you leave it clean. Uh, and uh, that's all I got. <laughs>
So important. We go right to the Lord. We confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a great God. A great God. A God of mercy. A God of love. Unconfessed sin, have you noticed, leads to a spiritual condition that some have referred to as spiritual lockjaw. It's real hard to tell someone about Jesus convincingly with unconfessed sin. Take a look, if you would, as we close here at Psalm 32. We're going to just read through it. These are the two Psalms that David wrote during this time of his life. The joy of forgiveness in Psalm 32. He is like, whew, I dealt with Nathan. I'm not going to die. That's sort of like, oh, oh, tax season's coming. Am I going to owe or not owe? (laughs) And you go, what? I get how much back? Whoa! This is way bigger than that. This is, I'm not going to die, I'm forgiven. Are you stinking kidding me? And he says, blessed, and it's in the plural, blessings upon blessings is he whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. David looks back at it and he says, you know, when I was silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long for day and night. Your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Say la about it. Meditate on it. We've mentioned this in the past. If you're from the South, they still use that in their conversation. They'll say, say la. And that's where it comes from is think about that. Say la, I had some good friends from Tennessee, met their parents, and oh man, there was say la going on as much as there is. Uh oh, there was say la everywhere. It was just one of those things. That's what it was. Verse 5 I acknowledged my sin to you. Sin. I acknowledge my sin to you. Sin is missing the mark. We've talked about hamartia in the Greek. Sin, it means to miss the mark. We're trying hard, but sometimes we just mess up. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you. And my iniquity I have not hidden. The word iniquity is a premeditated, without repentance type thing. We'll get to that in a minute. I said, I will confess my transgressions to you. There is sin, and then there is trespass. A trespass is intentionally or unintentionally crossing the line. Transgression is intentional disobedience. So he uses all these different terms. I've acknowledged my sin to you, my iniquity I've not hidden. I I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This iniquity is a premeditated, no repentance, crookedness, distortion. It's taking the word of God and twisting it so it can fit our sin. That's iniquity. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, when everything's pouring in on us, They're not going to come near. I love that. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. The Lord is speaking now. I will guide you with my eye. Just to look, those of you that have kids, you know the obedient child? Everyone's got one of them too, it seems, right? And if it's your first one and it's the obedient child, you usually have more than one. I was an only child. But if, if, you, if, if you have, <laughs> there, thank you, John, there it was, thanks, man. But if, if you have an obedient child, the first one, you go, this is easy, I don't know what the problem is. And then you have another one, they're obedient, you got two. People with seven kids, they had six obedient kids. And then you get that one. But you know, if, you, if you're an obedient child, you know that obedient child? You just look at them. And they're like, you say, this parenting's pretty easy. What's the problem? Just, just look at them. They won't do nothing. It's just what it is. That's what God is saying here. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I'm going to guide you just with my eye. If we're looking to the Lord and we're a child of His, walking in obedience, He'll just guide you. Don't be like the horse or like the mule. Stubborn, which have no understanding. They have to be harnessed with a bit and a bridle just to get them to turn or else they won't come near you. Many sorrows shall come to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy will surround him. Be glad in the Lord, rejoice you righteous, shout for joy, all you upright in heart. David is fired up because he flat out got forgiven. Oh, the goodness of forgiven. Go right to the Lord. Confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we receive the Lord Jesus, he says we can become part 
of his family. Simple as that. This is a day just to get right with the Lord. This is a day for the believers in here. If you're an unbeliever and you don't know Jesus, come talk to me. I'll be glad to introduce you to Christ. But this message really is aimed at believers. This is a time to get right with the Lord. Just get right. No big thing. Just get right. Just get right. Doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be emotional. But it's got to be real. And real confession, real turning to Christ will bring about real forgiveness. And that's the message here in these first 15 verses of 2 Samuel 12. David, a man after God's own heart, is forgiven as he confesses and turns. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. Thank you again just for time to get together here this morning. God, we pray as we uh, just look into our own heart right now, God, that there might be some of us even now Lord, we just need to talk to you. Lord, we need to talk to you. You tell us in your word that your spirit will convict of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Lord, the enemy is so quick to stick in our minds the shame of our sin. Lord, we're not hiding anything from you. You know everything about us. So Lord, we're just coming into your presence right now and asking you, Lord, to shine a light into the dark recesses of our soul where we have tried to bury stuff that had no business being buried. We bring it up, Lord, and we confess it to you. We ask God for your forgiveness, for your mercy, your grace. Lord, you tell us in your word that as far as the east is from the west, that's how far you remove our sin from us. Lord, you tell us in Isaiah, though our sin is like scarlet, you will make it as white as snow. <sighs> Forgiveness feels so good. Lord, forgive us for the resentment, the bitterness, the anger, the gossip, the stuff that we just allow to run through our minds, the recesses of our minds. The fact that we're breathing, Lord, tells all of us that's what we do. God, we ask for forgiveness. Lord, help us to forgive that one, that 10, that 500, whatever it is. God, help us to forgive. To truly just extend mercy and grace the way we want to receive it from you. Lord, you tell us in your word that people will know we're followers of you by the love we have one for another. God, help us to make that decision to love. To love, forgive, forgive. Jesus' name.